the Psalms, and we're going over to Psalm 100, reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. This is, called, of course, if you're reading from your Amplified, you will see a psalm of thanksgiving for the thank offering. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know, perceive, recognize, and understand with approval that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. And we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter. Enter, I love this, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and a thank offering and into his courts with praise or with joy. Be thankful and say so to him. Bless and affectionately praise his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithfulness and truth endure to all generations. I would like to start by saying this. A thankful heart, beloved, is not only the greatest virtue, it is the parent of all other virtues. A thankful heart is one of your most prized possessions. Psalm 104, 100 verse 4 says, To enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I love how the Message Bible reads this. It says it this way. Enter with the password, thank you. And make yourself at home talking praise. I'm going to say that again. The Message Bible says it this way. Enter with the password, thank you. So everyone together say, thank you. You know what? You just entered God's great gates. That's what the Bible says. Enter with the password and then make yourselves at home talking praise. In other words, thanksgiving and praise, beloved, are the keys to entering into God's presence and being at home there. Now, we're talking about benefits. You can't get a greater benefit than that. To know that by praising God and thanking God, you're at home with God. You've entered into his presence. Now, for the most of us, if we were honest about it, thankful doesn't come normal. It really doesn't come naturally. As I said last time, to bound out of bed every morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, some of you might be that blessed. I'm not. But I, w I had a husband that was. My husband was always a very early riser. And no matter if it was sunshine, rain, if it was winter, whatever it was, he bounded out of bed every morning. And it wouldn't matter if everybody else in the house wanted to have what we used to call a long lie. <laughs> Sleeping. I know none of you want that. It wouldn't matter. He would have the pots and the pans rattling and a rolling, and everybody had to get up any because he decided that he was going to make breakfast. And the, the irony of this story is that much as in those days I would like to sleep in, I never sleep in anymore. When I have the opportunity and there's no rattling of the pots and pans, I just want to get up anyway. But you know what? I would give to hear those pots and pans rattling again. Are you hearing me today? We have so much to be thankful for. But it doesn't always come naturally. Our normal fleshy tendency is to let all the circumstances determine our level of thankfulness. The problem with that, beloved, is depending on our circumstances at that moment, we may or we may not feel like being thankful for them. I've had to train myself to wake up in the morning and say, thank you, Jesus. I thank you this is the day you have made. I thank you that no matter what happens to me this day, you know all about it. Can you say amen? amen. 
So we might not always feel thankful. For the believer, that's you and I, being thankful is meant to be a way of life, regardless of what we might be experiencing at that moment. Because it's supposed to be an attitude of our hearts, beloved, that, that we maintain by the grace of Almighty God. Knowing every day how good God has been to us will keep us in an attitude of gratitude. I believe that it's vital for us. It's vital for us to choose. And I said choose. Say with me today, I choose. See, you're the one that does it. It's vital for us to choose to have a grateful attitude because just as thankfulness opens the door to God's presence, listen, thanklessness opens the door to the destroyer of our lives. Out of the abundance, beloved, of your heart, the mouth speaketh. So what we are believing in our hearts have to, will eventually come out of our mouths. When you have an ungrateful attitude, and we all know what that is, it's an attitude of murmuring and complaining and a never get enough attitude. Your worst day in a, the, 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 the country of the United States of America is, would be somebody's best day in a third world country. Just think, sometimes, I read some, a long, long time ago, these words, think and thank. Think and thank. Think that you leave here today. Most of you don't have to walk 20 miles to get home. You have a car or you have a bicycle. Many of you will leave this place today and go to a restaurant when somebody else will wait on you. Or you'll go home to a beautiful cooked meal and you have a roof over your head and all the things that we take for granted every day. But I think we're all coming into a place, beloved, in the times that we're living in to be a lot more thankful just to have our families and to have our health. Are you hearing me? And if we have ever needed to pray, now I know that Pastor Bob gets up here every Sunday and he makes the statement, you know, join us on a Wednesday night for prayer. Can I say something to you from the bottom of my heart? It's time. If you don't pray now, oh, but pastor, I pray at home. And I know that, and I understand that. And I know if you're, you've got a job schedule and babies, I understand all of that. But I know that you know that I know that God knows there are times you could be here. It's called corporate prayer. It's called two or more are gathered in my name. You are in the midst God is in the midst. And it's important that we pray together. And beloved, if there's ever been a time for the anointing on prayer meetings, it's now, Pastor Bob. It is now. I'm going to say it the way it is. What is it going to take? I would not be a good pastor if I didn't get up here and tell you this. We are living in evil times. But God, he said, where evil does abound, my grace does much more. Look up, your redemption draweth nigh, beloved. When we have an ungrateful attitude of murmuring and complaining, this is what you're doing. You're sending an invitation to come, for the enemy to come to your house. Just come. It's like, I'll explain it this way. If you had a dog and you wanted your dog to come and if your dog was outside, those of you that, that know how to whistle would, and you'd whistle. I can't whistle, obviously. And he would come running. Well, complaining, beloved, is like whistling for the devil. When he hears your ungrateful words, he just keep, comes running through the door of your soul. And he's quick and happy to give you more misery to complain about. Because misery loves company. So, how do we de defeat him? I believe one of the quickest ways that we defeat the enemy's oncoming slaughter to us 
It's just, it's always a constant mind game. Is anybody here? The battle's in the mind, constant, constant, constant. He'll come to you and he'll he'll try to, the Bible says that he wears down the saints. And if it's not one thing he'll come at you, it'll be another thing. You failed at this, you failed at that, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And where's your God right now? That's when you need to tell him, just get out of my face. Because I know how you end. I've read the back of the book. We already won, devil. Hallelujah. So how do we defeat him? I believe there's one of the quickest ways is through praise and thanksgiving. Psalm 149 verse 6, King David gives us a picture of our battle position against the enemy. Here he declares, Let the high praises of God be in their throats and a two-edged sword in their hands. A thankful attitude, beloved, protects us from a negative mindset and sets us free from Satan's captivity. As we thank Almighty God for who he is, his character, his ability, and his might, we will see his power for victory released to us and through us on our behalf. Gratitude is the fragrance of a contented heart. You and I need to make it, beloved, our daily aim to have a grateful heart and to resist complaining. And I'm like everybody else in here. Or maybe you're not like this. Maybe you think you never complain. I've had to catch myself more times than one about complaining. And you know, have you ever noticed how you complain? It's kind of like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm." and then you you kick things. Like you try to start your car, you get out, and what do you do? You kick the wheel like the car's going to listen to you. And we, and it's like we're, Mutton, 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 mutton. You know what the Bible says? To meditate therein day and night in Joshua. Do you know what he's talking about? Muttering. That's what it means. Meditating is muttering. So what we're supposed to say, you will supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. I'll tell you something. You start that, you won't be, you will supply all my, no, you'll be, you will supply all my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. By your stripes, I was healed. You will find that all the muttering as far as the negative side of it will end. Because you can't complain and praise God at the same time. That's one of the greatest benefits you will ever have, beloved. To be able to say, you know what, Lord? No matter what I'm going through, and I, I, I was taught this by the best, by my own father. He used to say all the time, you might think you've got it bad. There's always somebody worse off than you. So we need to make it our daily aim to resist complaining. Now, I don't mean that you and I stick our head in the sand and we avoid dealing with the things that are negative or difficult in our life. I'm not saying that. What we do need to do is make it our goal to be as positive as we possibly can every day. That we can maintain a positive attitude. It's much easier to fill our mind and our mouth with appreciation. Much, much easier. Psalm 106 says it this way. Verse 21. This is what I'm talking about. They, the Israelites, forgot their Savior, their God which had done great things in Egypt. They forgot. They they, they forgot all about him. That's what the scripture says. The reasoning that the Israelites used or didn't use was amazing. It was as if they forgot all that the Lord had done to bring them to the land of Canaan. Beloved, don't fall into that trap. What was your Egypt? I want to ask that question today. What was your Egypt? What did God bring you out of? 
the Lord brought them out of Egypt, which was the most powerful nation on the earth at that time. It wasn't done through their might. There were supernatural plagues that were brought upon the Egyptians and brought them to their knees. The Israelites didn't leave empty either. They didn't leave empty. A nation that had been enslaved for over 400 years departed wealthy. My God, I hope you're hearing me today. You may have been in all kinds of darkness in Egypt before you came to know the Lord. But if you look at your life today, for the most part now, I know we all deal with things, but for the most part, you will see how much wealth you came out of Egypt with. Most of us today, when you're born again, you're not enslaved anymore to alcohol, to drugs. You can go to bed at night. You can sleep. You can praise God. You have, you have friends that love God. You, you have a family that's at peace. You, you may have been end, ending up in the divorce court before you get saved, and God saved your marriage. I could go on and on and on. But you know what? God was the one that did it. And when the, when the, when the plagues were brought upon the Egyptians, I may have said the Israelites, and I correct that if I did. The plagues were brought on the Egyptians, but those plagues brought them to their knees. And the Israelites walked out free. And this is what, what the scripture is trying to say to us today. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. You keep keeping that thankful heart before God and believing God. He knew the Egypt you were in, beloved. He certainly knew the Egypt this little lady was in. I have never forgotten the rock from whence I was hewn. How long were you and I enslaved? Oh, we might have been enslaved to many things that people could have seen, you know, I mean, this might, this might uh, you might think I'm crazy, crazy saying this, but I'm telling you the truth. There was a time in my life when I smoked three and a half packs of cigarettes a day and had another pack of brown moors just for emergencies. I used to joke about it. I'm talking about there was never an ashtray in my house that didn't have a cigarette in it. All day long. And I don't need to go into the rest of it all. But that's just one of the enslavements that I was in. These were just things that people could see. You know, like my, the alcohol or whatever, the drugs, whatever. I was never into drugs. But, but things that people can see. But beloved, I want to talk to you about something that's as is important, if not more important. What about how he brought you out of what's going on inside of you? that nobody can see. And see, what happens is when we point our finger at somebody, they're doing this, or they're doing that. I'll be honest with you, beloved. When Before I got saved, when Pastor Dave was saved first, and he would talk to me about God. He was never, never walked the love walk till <laughs> a long, long time later. But anyway, he would say things to me about being a Christian, and he would, he would call me the daughter of Satan. And the same to you, buddy, you know? And the more he would say that, I would, I know, I've forgotten how to do it. <laughs> I'd, I'd inhale and I'd, I know none of you can relate. And then I'd lift up my Manhattan and I'd say, cheers. <laughs> you see, it doesn't do anybody any good when you say, shh, you shouldn't be smoking. It's not good for your health. What is that going on inside of you? There's judgmental spirit there. Oh, I just mean it's for their own good. Well, then just get on your knees and pray. Amen. Hallelujah. It took me a long time to give up those weeds. A long time. 
the alcohol left my life months before the cigarettes did because I honestly believed you take those from me, I've got nothing else worth living for. You think, you're crazy. Listen, I started smoking at 15 years old. At 33 was my last cigarette. I don't know why I'm saying this today, but you need to hear it. But what about the things that we are so thankful to God for that he's delivered inside? Judgmental spirit, uh, being bitter and angry and, and, and unforgiveness and all the other things. You'd lie in your bed at night and you'd be plotting how you can get them. <laughs> I'm going to get that one. <laughs> and you're losing sleep and that person doesn't know anything about it. And then the Holy Spirit just gently talks to you and says, you know, I love you and I love that person. And even though you do drugs and you do this and you're addicted to this and you're addicted to that, I love you unconditionally. You know, beloved, the Bible says, those who are forgiven much, love much. And when you see me up here, I can tell you the one thing God knows and I know. I was forgiven much and I love much because I know the benefits of having a thankful heart. No matter what, I choose every day to say, Lord, I thank you. I think and I thank. So what's God delivered you from? What's, what was your Egypt? And you may still be still holding on to some of those things in Egypt. That's okay. God's timing is perfect. And it's not up to you and I to choose our timings. Or we can choose our timings to make decisions, don't make misunderstand me. But you can't choose it for other people. Hallelujah. It should have been obvious to these people, the Israelites, that the Lord favored them and willed for them to succeed. He didn't bring the children of Israel out of Egypt so that they could die in the wilderness. He didn't bring you out of all of that so that you'd be miserable for the rest of your life having the do's and the don'ts and the do's and the don'ts. Christianity is not do, do, do. Christianity is done, done, done. And when you have a thankful heart before God, you will overcome every obstacle the enemy puts in your way. And that deserved an applause for God. For God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If he brought you out to just leave you in misery, it would be inconsistent with everything that he did for them. He knew there were giants in the land, and he made the promise to give it to them. You'll have that land. But he planned for them to succeed, beloved, not fail. I want you to say this with me today. I will succeed, and I will not fail. No matter what the situation is in your life, you want change today, I want you to say it again. I want you to, first of all, think about what you would like to see changed in your life or what you would need delivered from in your life. Whatever the case might be, only God knows your heart. And I want you to say this. I will succeed, not fail. Turn to the person beside you and say, that means you too. In other words, the events that brought the Israelites out of the land of Canaan were so miraculous, beloved, that there was no doubt that God had done it. Therefore, it should have been apparent to everyone that regardless of what challenges laid ahead, the Lord was with them to bring his promise. And they miss the obvious. And I see this every day in Christianity, beloved. We miss the obvious looking at us. How? Three times in this chapter, and I'm reading, I'm talking about Psalm 106. 106. Three times in verse 7, 13, and 21, it talks about your memory. 
Your memory is the one of the most important factors in keeping your heart in tune with God. Doing this at this season of the year, whether it be Thanksgiving that's just passed or Christmas is coming, make a special effort to remember the goodness of the Lord. And you will find, beloved, as I have, that it will build your faith. Don't forget the price that was paid. Don't take your salvation, and especially today, don't take your freedom for granted. Oh, hallelujah. When you recognize the benefits of being thankful, beloved, you will turn your thanksgiving into thanks living. As we will see in this true story that I'm about to tell you. And it starts like this. A carpenter I hired had just finished a rough first day on the job. A flat tire had made him lose an hour of work. His electric saw had quit, and now his ancient pickup truck refused to start. As I drove him home, he sat in stony silence. On arriving, he invited me to meet his family. As we walked toward the front door, he paused briefly at a small tree and touched the tips of it with the, of the branches with both of his hands. As he opened the door, he suddenly underwent an amazing transformation. His tanned face was wreathed with smiles. He hugged his two children and gave his wife a kiss. Afterwards, as he walked me back to the car, we passed the tree again. And my curiosity got the better of me. So I asked him about what I had seen him do earlier. Oh, he says, that's my trouble tree. I know I can't avoid having troubles on the job. But one thing's for sure. They don't belong at home with my wife and with my children. So I just hang them on the tree every night. Then in the morning, I pick them up again. But the funny thing is, when I come out in the morning, there aren't as many as I remembered hanging there the night before. Why was this? I read that story and I went, what is the key there, Lord? And he spoke clearly to me, beloved. He had a thankful heart. He believed in my unfailing love that never ends he believed that my mercies begin fresh every day. Do you think maybe some of us in here might need one of those trees? As we read in 2 Peter 1.13, Yea, I think it right as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. That's what I'm doing here today. I'm asking you and your hearts, beloved, to remember the good things that God has done for you. And you might say, well, I don't remember too many. Come on. If you live in this great country, you can be thankful for where you live for starters. Amen? I know I get on my soapbox when it comes to America, but that's the way it is. When you are a first general generation immigrant like I am, you know what you're talking about. Hallelujah. Peter's time, and he was writing this, on earth was limited. This probably was one of his last exhortations to the people that he loved so much. Yet instead of imparting one more piece of information, no, he didn't do that. He reminded them of what they already knew. He used the power of their memories to stir them up. Beloved, memory is a powerful thing. One sight, one sound, one smell can trigger emotions and actions that we may never have experienced in years. Remember the things that God has done for you. As I was reading this and, and doing my notes on this, I, I couldn't help but think of, about being an immigrant to this country. And no matter how long you're here, 
And I left Scotland in 1967, so count it for yourself, it's a long time. But to this day, beloved, I can't hear the song, Old Lang Syne. Da 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 I can't hear that without weeping. Why? Because it brings back memories of every New Year's Eve in my father's home when we would sing it. And then we'd join hands for the sake of old Lang Syne. You can't think that way without. This is what the... What Peter was saying, I put you in remembrance. Remember the good things. Remember how God brought you out. Remember coming out of Egypt. Christians, remember. I had an experience many years ago with my sister Chris that was alive at the time. And Pastor Dave and I took her back to Scotland. She was, she was ill at the time. But she wanted to see Scotland again. I'll never forget this because every time I read that scripture, I see the truth in it. There could be things buried inside of you for years and something just triggers that memory and will bring you peace and joy. And what had happened was we had come out of Presswick Airport, which is Presswick and then Air where I lived, and, and we were driving. My brother-in-law was driving us to, he was, she was going to stay with, we were staying with them in their home and my sister was too. And we passed a place called this is the high street, which means like the main street in every town in Scotland has a high street. That's where all the new mothers take the babies and the buggies to, so that everybody sees their babies. Every Saturday, they do the parade up and down the high street. I'm very serious. And when the babies were born, we would always take them out if we needed some money. Because when a Scottish lady or man would look at a new baby in the buggy, they would never walk away without blessing the child with silver. Hallelujah. <laughs> so they'd put the silver underneath the pillow. We blessed the child. Oh, we knew what we were doing. Hallelujah. <laughs> but in this high street, we had a tower called the Wallace Tower. Now, you would understand. It was Robert Wallace, and you would know him as Brave Heart. And what Robert Wallace was born in our area. So this Wallace Tower was up long before I was ever even thought about. Okay. But it was a meeting place. And it was always where you would meet your boyfriend or your girlfriend. And then you go dancing or whatever else you did. And many, many, many times I would meet Pastor Dave under the clock at the Wallace Tower. And from my home, I could open the window in my bedroom and look out and see the clock. And I could read it. That's how close I was to it. Well, my sister Christine was not affected by anything in this long journey from Presswick into Ayr. And all of a sudden, she saw the Wallace Tower and she went hysterical. She, she I, I couldn't, I've never, I'd never seen Chris emotional. She was always like the matriarch, you know, the oldest sister that was always in control and did control to a degree. But she was the one that was sponsored by my husband and I to come to America. She was never out of control till she saw the Wallace Tower. What happened? A memory. And she said, oh, my God, the Wallace Tower. And she wept like a baby. What was she thinking about? She was thinking about her husband and her that met there. He was an airman. He was in the forces stationed in Presswick. All of those wonderful memories flooded back. And as we were driving by, she said, it was worth coming back just to see the Wallace Tower. What am I saying, beloved? If you think hard enough, you'll remember some great things God did for you. You may not even know how many times he saved your life. How many times these ministering angel, angels were encompassed around you? You might never know till you get to the other side. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Memory is a powerful thing. That's why Peter said, I put you in remembrance. What did Jesus say? We had communion today. This do what? In remembrance of me. God is remembering you. 
I think there's, I'd have to look it up again, but I think there's 70 something times in the Bible where God says, He remembers you. He remembers you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I had so much more, but I'm going to start. But not, I'm not closing yet, but I'm starting. <laughs> you know, the truth is, beloved, if I'm not content with what I have, I'll never be content with what I want. Let's remember the goodness of God and be thankful. But you say, well, pastor, you don't know. You don't know the rejection I've been through in my life. Really? Walk five minutes in a pastor's life and we'll tell you what rejection spells and what it means. What about Jesus in Matthew 21, 42? He's, it says this, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the, store, of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Listen, God can turn rejection into direction if you let him. He specializes in blessing rejects. Paul wrote, everyone deserted me. Paul, the Apostle Paul, everybody deserted him. I mean, we've, had, we've all had moments when somebody would say, I'm behind you, and you look back and you say, how far are you? I can't see you. But everybody deserted Paul. But the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength. Your blessing, beloved, any blessings that you receive are not dependent about somebody else on somebody else's actions. They are not. When you're in step with the beat of God's heart, the purposes of God will come forth and absolutely nothing can keep God from blessing you. Let that sink in. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Hallelujah. As I close, remember a thankful heart always encourages others to see the benefits that the word of God promises us. I want to read this story as I close. It's called The Tale of Two Frogs. Everybody say, the tale of two frogs is going to bless me. All ah, right. A group of frogs were passing through the woods, and suddenly two of them fell into a deep pit. All the other fro frogs gathered around the pit to see what was going on. And when they saw how deep the pit was, they told the two frogs that they were as good as dead. The two frogs ignored the comments and tried to jump up, up out of the pit with all of their might. The other frogs kept telling them to stop. There was no use, there was no hope. Finally, one of the frogs took heed to what the other frogs were saying, gave up, he fell down, and he died. The other frog continued to jump as hard as he could, and once again, the crowd of frogs yelled at him, stop the pain and just die. He jumped even harder and finally made it out. And when he got out, the other frog said, did you not hear us? And the frog explained to them that he was 90% deaf. He said, I just assumed you were encouraging me all the time. This story teaches us, beloved, the benefits of praise, which can come in any form, because there is life and death in the power of the tongue. An encouraging word to someone who is down can bring them up and help them make it through a difficult day. And they can triumph over their difficulty just by a few kind words that you and I took the time to say. Spread some encouragement today. Thank God for his mercies. Thank him. Thank him for everything that he's ever did for you. When you understand God's grace towards you, you will show that grace to others. But you may be sitting here this morning and you're saying to yourself, 
Pastor Pat, I have taken so much for granted in my life. I have been in a place in my life that, you know, I've, I, I've been complaining. I've been belittling. I've been doing things I know that I know that I know I shouldn't be doing. And I want to get it right today. So, Alex, would you come, please? I'm going to do something this morning. And if you do not desire to stay, that's fine. We, we will, you know, you can quietly leave. But I'm going to open up these altars this morning. I believe the Holy Spirit spoke it to me as I was ministering. Because he wants to heal you. He wants to heal you. He wants you to remember the good things. But he needs to heal you of the things you don't want to remember. So that you can get them under the blood once and for all. So I'm just going to ask you this morning just to come and kneel at these altars, and the eldership of the house will pray with you as you're kneeling here. We're just going to be led by the Spirit. And again, there is no, no one needs to, to concern themselves at all if you have to leave. But I, I believe God's going to do some awesome things right now. So all I'm saying to you is just to come, come and kneel before the Lord if you so desire. And I will officially close the, the service when we're finished praying. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.